Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? Ye that have seen me have seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. But the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in my Father, and my Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. God is good. And all the time. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I welcome you to the house of God to worship him in spirit. Say it again, in spirit and in truth. Most of the world, from my amateurish observation, worship the God in so-called spirit, which means noise and jumping around and shouting. But where the spirit is not, a truth isn't present, the spirit isn't present at all. Because his name is the spirit of truth. You cannot separate spirit from truth. So if you have what you call spirit, and you do not have truth, you must ask yourself, what spirit do I really have? When Joshua came off the mountain with Moses, and he heard the noise, he said to Moses, there's the sound of war in the camp. For them... That was the spirit. For them, it was not truth. And Moses had to identify, no, this is not war. Those are the people worshiping. John 4, 24, God is the spirit, and they that worship him must. It is non-negotiable. Must worship him. Finish the verse. In spirit, come on, and in sincerity is not enough. God must serve, we must serve God in sincerity and in truth. Thank God for truth. Truth ultimately is Christ. I am the way, the truth. I've told you many times, I believe, the Father is truth. Deuteronomy 32 verse 4. The Holy Ghost is truth. 1 John 5 verse 6. Jesus is truth. Uh, John 14 6. The Father is truth. The Son is truth. The Holy Spirit is truth. To be a child of God fully. I must be a child that loves truth. Nice to see you. You look very nice. In the outfits God has given you, say amen. amen. All right. For those of you online, I can't see you, but I know you look nice as well. Thank you for joining us wherever you are. God bless you beyond your imagination. I really mean that. For the family members at Born Again and at FMC, First Missouri City, God bless you. And we know the spirit is the same wherever he is. I want to jump right into the message because we have quite a bit to do today. But before I do, I would be remiss if I did not recognize anyone who is not a Seventh-day Adventist. First, in this building, is there someone sitting before me who is not a Seventh-day Adventist? May I see your hand? Ah, please stand. Please. Please stand. Good morning. How do you do? It is a delight to see you. Tell us your name. Chrissy? 
Chrissy, nice name. It sounds like Christ. Good name. Chrissy, where are you from? Pasadena, California. Oh, no, joke it. Okay. All right. Chrissy, who invited you, Chrissy? Uh, you have a good friend. Chrissy, may the Lord bless your life, bless your family, and grant you the desires of your heart. Say amen for Chrissy. Amen. Chrissy, you may be seated. God bless you. Nice smile. Who's next? Did I see another hand? A hand threatening to go up? No. Where? All right, just do that so I can see who the person is. Oh, please stand, please. Good morning. How are you? Good to see you. What's the name? Roger. Good to see you, Roger. Where are you from? Baytown. All right, so you're home. Who invited you, Roger? Your beautiful wife. God bless your beautiful wife. I agree with you 100%. Roger, I am glad you came. May the Lord bless you, but put a double blessing on your wife. Do you agree, Roger? Say yes. Grace glows. All right. Roger, thanks for coming, and the Lord bless you. Say amen for Roger. Amen. Roger's a nice man. What's your wife's name? <laughs> Roger, I just put you in great danger. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all right. Give us her name again. Vanda. Vanda? Vanda, God bless you. Forgive Roger. <laughs> Handsome people don't have good memories. Forgive Roger. All right. Anybody else? You're not a Seventh-day Adventist. Anybody else? Oh, please, Stan. Please. Please. What's your name? Kathy. Kathy? Hello, Kathy. Where are you from? From Baytown. From Baytown. And who invited you, Kathy? Your mother-in-law. Always listen to your mother-in-law if you want to live long. Nice to see you, Kathy. Now, Kathy, may the Lord bless you. I mean that from my heart. Guide you, direct you, keep you from the dangers of life. Say amen for Kathy. Amen. My dear sister Kathy, you may sit. Hello. No, no, don't sit. Just, oh, your daughter. And what's your name? Caroline. Caroline. How are you, Caroline? Are you a visitor too? Good. Where are you from? Baytown. And who invited you? Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for coming. And may God place a hand of mercy upon you and never remove it and protect you from the attacks of the enemy. Say amen for Kathy. Amen. You may be seated, please, please. And when I say what I say, I'm praying with my eyes open. Anybody else? You're not a Seventh-day Adventist? Oh, please, please, please stand. You wanted to be the best for the last, I understand. It's okay. What's your name? Andrea. Hello, Andrea. Where are you from? Crosby. Where is that? Is that in Texas? It is. All right. Not too far away. Okay. Andrea, who invited you? Sherry. Now, who's Sherry? Oh, way over there. Thank you. Oh, you're a busy person. Thank you very much. Andrea, God bless you. God take care of you. And I want God to bless you so much that wherever you go, you become a blessing to someone else. Say amen for Andrea. Amen. You may be seated, my lovely sister. God is good. All the time. And all the time. And for those of you who are guests at Born Again or FMC or wherever you are, you're not a Seventh-day Adventist. May the Lord bless you and thank you for joining us in this service. It's now ooh, almost 11.30. As I said, we have a long day. I want to jump right into the message. Uh, before I do that, let me ask you to do three little things for me. Favor number one, preserve reverence. Concentrate, let no one distract you. Because in that five or ten seconds of distraction, I may say something God sent for you. You may not need the entire sermon. God may send a message in ten seconds and you miss it because someone with good intentions distracted you. Favor number two, and for those of you at home, preserve reverence where you are in your homes. I know you're relaxed but try to be reverent. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And as God lives, I want to speak God's words as simply as I can. And favor number three, I want you to think as you listen. 
Don't just swallow what I say. Think. Read the verses I read. Is he actually reading the Bible verses? Think. Isaiah 1.18, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. The best reasoning people should be genuine Christians. Because they reason under the guidance of the spirit of truth. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear God, we come to you today on this holy day, which most of the world overlooks or ignores or, or are genuinely unaware of. Whatever the case, dear God, we thank you for having brought the light of truth to us. And as we bow before you, look upon us with favor, dear God. Look upon us with mercy. Because you love us and because of the sacrifice of Christ. If we've offended you, forgive us, God. Remove the offense and grant us more of your grace. As we listen to the words of life, and the words of the Bible are words of life, grant us the assistance of your Holy Spirit that he may guide us into truth. Jesus said in John 16, 13, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Guide our minds, dear God, and keep us from the track of error that runs right next to the track of truth. Father, if anyone listening to me has COVID-19, in the name of Jesus, who healed everyone who came to him when he was on this earth, Remove that affliction from that person, dear God. Father, just to be merciful, please heal anyone listening to me who has COVID-19. Bless the visitors in a very special way. And Father, for those little boys and little girls who may be listening, touch their minds. Because at a little age, Jesus knew the scriptures. Paul says of Timothy, as a child, thou hast known the holy scriptures. So touch their little minds, I pray, and help them to understand that you are pleased when children give their lives to you. Now, dear God, I pray for this country. Bless the leaders, Father. Let them, to make, let them make decisions that honor your name and are advantageous to the gospel. Wherever countries are represented by those listening, bless them too, I pray. I humble myself before you. Speak. Through me, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Go with me to Genesis 11. We shall read from verse 1. Genesis 11, reading from verse 1. Our subject, an emergency call. What did I say? An emergency call. Genesis 11, reading from verse 1, and I read from the King James Version of the Bible. When you found it, say amen. amen. If you're still looking, say amen. amen. Oh, you're still looking, sister. It's Genesis, sister. Can't be that hard to find. All right, Genesis 11, reading from verse 1. Reading from the King James Version, the Bible says, And the whole earth was of one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. We will reread verse 4, this time microscopically. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. Now, this is after the flood. They're clearly thinking, if another flood comes, we can, we can go into a tower that is so high, the flood will not affect us. So let us make a tower whose top may reach right unto heaven. But notice how the verse ends. And let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Let's establish ourselves as powerful. Let our enemies tremble at the sound of our names. Let us establish our name. Now, this is important. Go to Genesis 12, the very next chapter. An emergency call. I hope you're concentrating. You look as if you are. What book did I say? Genesis, what chapter? 12 from verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. 
and I will make of thee a great nation. And I will do what? Bless thee, come on, and make thy name great. Now, what did we read in Genesis 11 verse 4? You go back there now. Don't lose Genesis 12 verse 2. We go back to Genesis 11 4. Listen to what the builders of the Tower of Babel said. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us do what? Make us a name. We will make our own name. Now these are the persons opposed to God. Now notice why. Let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. They did not want to scatter. They wanted to concentrate themselves into cities. Go to Genesis 1. Genesis 1, our subject, an emergency call. I'm happy to see so many Bibles. Nothing wrong with a phone, but a phone is not a Bible. It's nice to see so many Bibles. But if you're using a phone, God loves you too. Don't panic. But nice to see Bibles. Genesis 1, reading from verse 26. Let me pray again. God of heaven, God of truth, speak through me, please, and restrain my carnal nature. In Jesus' name, amen. And God said, let us make man how? In our image, after our likeness. Keep reading. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the and over and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now, in verse 28, God blessed them and God said unto them, what? Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. They were to go all over the earth and live. This was God's stated desire before he actually made them. Then he made them and he gave them what his wish was or his desire. Occupy the entire world. Spread out. Listen to the builders of Babel. Verse 4 of Genesis 11. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we what? Be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. We don't want to occupy the whole earth. We want to concentrate. What we have now is uh, uh, the first national or kingdom-wide apostasy against God's clearly stated will. Now I said... Kingdom wide. Why do I say kingdom wide? Let us go to Genesis 10. Our subject, an emergency call. Genesis 10, we read from verse 6. Are you there? Amen. And the sons of Ham were Cush and Mizraim and Phut and Canaan. Now we have the sons of Ham. One of them is Cush. Now we go to verse 8. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it was said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Bebel and Eric and Akid and Kalne in the land of Shinar. That's where Nimrod establishes kingdom. Keep the word Shinar in mind. Now go back to chapter 11. Chapter 11, verse 1. Are you there? You may read with me. And the whole earth was of one language, and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed where? They found a plain where? In the land of Shinar. This connects chapter 11 with chapter 10. The leader of those people must have been whom? Nimrod, you see. And the beginning of his kingdom, chapter 10, verse 10, was Babel, Eric, Akid, Kalne, in the land of Shinar. Now, what is the land of Shinar? Go to Daniel 1. Daniel 1. Our subject is... Too slow, too slow. Our subject is an emergency call. All right. Daniel 1, reading from verse 1. Are you struggling to find Daniel? You have it? Okay. You have it now? All right, my sister is still looking. She is methodical. We'll give her 10 more seconds. All right. Are you, have, are you there now? 
in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. Carefully now, verse 2. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried where? Into the land of China. Where did Nebuchadnezzar come from? China. What's the other name for China? Babylon. Now, in Revelation, who is God's chief earthly opponent? Babylon. Now go back to Genesis 10. We're looking at the roots of God's mightiest enemy on earth. We're looking at the roots. And what's our subject? An emergency call. What do you think that call is? Come out. Come out. Genesis 10 verse 8. And Cush begat Nimrod. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Pause. Let's look at mighty hunter. He began to be a mighty one before the Lord. He was a mighty hunter. Let's look at mighty one. Go to Genesis 6. What is a mighty one? Genesis 6. And it came to pass when men began to multiply up from verse 1, sorry, upon the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, very pretty, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, what? My spirit shall not always strive with man. Pause. The spirit of God does not plead with you forever. After a while, he ceases. Let me say it differently. After a while, through constant rejection, the conscience ceases to hear that convicting voice. My spirit shall not always strive with God. Is love, yes. But God has limits to our wickedness. He has limits to our continual rebellion. He has limits because if he had no limits, he could be accused of loving rebellion. But he hates it, so he wants to stop it. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. Now read verse 4 with me. There were giants in the earth also, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. You see, you have a mixed up situation. The same bare children to them, which, were, which became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. So we have this mixture of God's people with the ungodly. Produced. Mighty men. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. From this, this, uh, this union, God did not sanction. Mighty men. Now go back to chapter 10. We read from verse 8 again. Can't read it too often. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. Here's an example of one of these mighty men. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. He was a mighty hunter not only of animals but of men. That's why he was the leader. He led by force. God leads by love. And so the, be the beginning of his kingdom, verse 10, was Babel. What does Babel mean? There are two definitions given. The gate of God. And what's the other one? Confusion. The gate of God not being the God of heaven and earth. You, could, my, you might as well say the gate of gods. All the false gods. All the false worship. Now the tower of Babel, no one knows, has ever seen it. But similar structures have been unearthed. They're called ziggurats. And they're tall. And they all have at the top a place of worship. Worship the sun, whatever else, false worship. And Bible scholars and anthropologists who have studied have traced all this false worship and sun worship and everything back to this time when Nimrod set up his kingdom. What have we said? The kingdom of Nimrod, made of a Babel, Eric, Akkad, Kalne, in the land of Shinar, this is Babylon. What was their stated intention? We do not want to scatter all over the earth. What did God say? Replenish the earth. What we have is organized opposition to God. But it was a worship system. 
You see, the, the word church can deceive you. This side didn't hear me. I said two mm-hmms from that side, nothing from this side. Let me show it again. The word church can be deceiving. The word, the word gospel, when not used in the context of scripture, can be misleading. Paul says, if any man preach any other gospel unto you. So the fact that someone says gospel, you ought to go study for yourself. When you hear church, you ought to go study, come on, for yourself. Because church can mean all kinds of things. There's a church of Satan. It's a church. The word church from the Greek, ecclesia, simply means a coming together, a calling out, a gathering. Which the Greeks used when they came together as assemblies to conduct the business of the cities. That was an ecclesia. And the, you know, the Bible writers used that word because the word was familiar to the audience. It's just a calling out, but a calling out from what and to what? Church of Scientology is a church. Are you following me? Yes. Cults are churches. And so when you hear church or gospel, you've got to be careful. When the Israelites were coming into Canaan, God told them in Deuteronomy 18 verse 9, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. In other words, the, the, the church behavior was so disgusting to God, the Bible describes it as abomination. Part of their worship service was live child sacrifices from time to time. And God said in verse 10, They shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. So the fact that it happens in church does not make it right. It has to be consistent with, Thus saith the Lord. Somebody say amen. And so what we have with Nimrod back there was a religious system and a political system. In Revelation, let's go to Revelation. Well, before we go to Revelation, let's go back to Daniel 1. Sorry about that. Let's, uh, let me redirect you. Go back to Daniel 1. Let's take a close look. Chapter 1. No, let's go to chapter 2. Chapter 2. Chapter 2. I don't want to give you too much, but I want to give you enough. Are you at chapter 2? Yes. All right. Let's bow our heads. Father, as we continue to study your word, let the Spirit guide us, God. And as John 7:17 7, says, if any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine. Give us all a willingness to obey you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Go to chapter 3. Let's read from verse 1. Chapter 3. 3. 3. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was three score cubits, and the breadth thereof, six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. Now, from verse 4 we said, Then an herald cried aloud, To you it is what? Commanded. By whom? By whom? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar did not oversee a democracy. His was a one-man rule. And the Bible describes him this way, Whom he would, he slew. Whom he would, he kept alive. It was entirely up to him. He was a cruel man. Cruel man. Yet, God allowed him to conquer Jerusalem. Let me slide this into your consciousness. There's nothing on earth political that God does not oversee. Do you think political events just happen? The highest final guiding power is the hand of God. Guiding events according to what he intends. Understand, when you understand that, you don't have to get into fights with people. Are you following me? Amen. Let every soul be subject unto the higher power. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. God is in final control. Daniel 5.17, the Most High ruleth in the affairs of men. Daniel 5.27, the Most High ruleth in the affairs of men. Daniel 5.32, the Most High ruleth in the affairs of men. And when we understand that as a Christian Bible base, we have a peace of mind others don't. Because our understanding begins in heaven. Theirs begin and stay on earth. 
Are you following me? So Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold in verse 4. And then an herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nation, languages. What does that tell you? People, nations, languages. The whole world. That's the world of the Bible. The whole world. That at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, he fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king have set up. Who set it up? Nebuchadnezzar. Now, commandment number two. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them so we have a clear commandment from god nebuchadnezzar made the image he required people to bow to the image now we have three hebrew boys three seventh day adventists from way back Nobody said amen. I, just want to say, I am not coming back to this place. Three seventh day Adventists who honored God's law, they were in that crowd. And the herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded. Let me digress. The command of the state cannot have more weight than the command of God. The command of the church cannot have more weight than the command of God. Nebuchadnezzar commanded, but God had earlier commanded, and the command of God must countermand the commands of men. Three boys wouldn't bow. Nebuchadnezzar called them. Verse 15. Now, if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. In other words, idol worship is good. <laughs> Are you following as well? But if you worship not, in other words, if you disobey me and obey God, he shall be cast the same hour into a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hand? Now, he was the most powerful man on earth. He wants to know, is this someone more powerful than I that can deliver you from my wrath? Who is that God? Don't tell God that. Because when he shows you, you won't like it. Pharaoh said in Exodus 5 verse 2, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I know not the Lord and I will not let Israel. And God showed him who he was. Told Moses, leave, leave, leave. Nebuchadnezzar said, who is that God? And in chapter 4, God showed him. Struck him, he became an animal-like creature for seven years. On hands and knees, eating grass. The dew falling on him. His beard, his hair, his nails. Like an animal, seven years. Until the Bible says he lifted up his eyes and acknowledged God. And God restored his sanity and his kingdom. God's a good God. Say amen. God does not hold grudges, but don't challenge God. And so he set up this image. And if you read Daniel, 9, Daniel 3, all the way down to verse 18 or so, you'll see Nebuchadnezzar set up. 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 Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this manner. If it be so, our God whom we serve, that's, that's important, whom we serve, when, they, when Darius threw Daniel into the lion's den, he said, Oh, Daniel, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee? Don't just think God jumps in and saves you while you serve Satan. Uh, this mic isn't working. You can't be serving Satan and look for God's deliverance and God's blessings. But a lot of Christians do that. We have Babylonian lifestyles and we want Jerusalem blessings. It doesn't work. Our God whom we serve. Question for you now. Do you serve God? Don't answer me. Our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not. Ah, powerful words. 
Don't serve God conditionally. If you give me a husband, I'll come to church. If you give me a job, I'll come to church. If you get rid of mine enemy, I'll come. No, no, no. I'll come to church because you want me to come. Amen. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king. I love that. I've talked about that very often. I like be it known unto thee. Many young people in college, they don't say to their friends, be it known unto thee, I'm a seventh day Adventist. They hide. On the job. We don't say to our colleagues, be it known unto thee, I don't eat pork. I don't drink alcohol. I'll do, I will not do that in order to fit in. Be it known unto thee, I don't declare myself better. I declare myself a follower of thus saith the Lord. Be it known unto thee. When you let people know, you, you save them from confusion. Then they're better able to make a choice. I want to follow, I don't. When you confuse them, God holds you responsible. Be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And so Nimrod set up this system to oppose God's clearly stated will. Scatter. Nebuchadnezzar set up an image which also opposed God's will. Now in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. He saw an image. But it was made of all gold. That was him. No, sorry, it was made of gold, silver, brass, and uh, iron, feet of iron and clay. He understood from Daniel, the head of gold was him. That's you. Silver, someone else is coming. Another kingdom inferior to thee, Daniel 2, verse 39. Then one of brass, the Greeks. Then iron, the Romans. Iron and clay, the, the kingdoms at the end of the world. After the Roman Empire fell in 476. He did not like that interpretation. My kingdom will end. So in chapter 3, he makes his own image. He doesn't dream about it. He makes it. Are you with me? This is reality now. It's all gold from head to foot. God's image he set up as a means of teaching a lesson. Only the head is gold. In other words, this is God's version of history. Babylon. Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. This is God's, that is God's doctrine. That is God have determined the times before and the bounds of the habitation. Acts 17, uh, verse 26, I believe it is. Nebuchadnezzar said, no, I don't like that version of history. I don't like God's version. I'll set up my version. This image is all gold. He wanted to say, Babylon will last, come on, forever. Are you suffering because you serve God? Your suffering will not last forever. God will bring it, believe me, God will bring it to an end when he sees that the, the training he's trying to give you is successful. The more you cooperate with God, the shorter your suffering is. But some of us have to be taught again and again and again and again. And God wants to save us so badly, he keeps teaching us again. Every lesson becomes more painful than the previous one. Which means the smart way to deal with God, when he says it, do it. And so we have a death penalty in Gen uh, Daniel 3 for not bowing. We know the boys were thrown into the fire. God brought them out. Go to verse 28 of chapter 3. I want you to see how powerful God is. Our subject, an emergency call. It is, oh, 5 to 12. This is, this is probably my longest sermon I don't leave. What chapter did I say? 3 of Daniel, verse 28. Let me pray. Father, as I continue, let me be conscious this is for your glory and your glory alone. And for the blessing of your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Do you have my version? Read with me. What does 28 say? Then Nebuchadnezzar, what? Spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Keep reading. Who have sent his angel and delivered his servants that... Trusted in him. Stop. Question for you. Don't answer me. Do you trust God? If you do, you'll return a tithe. Who made the trees? That was food. Can God feed you? Yes. Who made the sun? God. Who made atmosphere? Oxygen. God. Who made the water? God. Can God provide for you? Yes. What did Jesus say? Behold the fowls of the air. 
They sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly father feedeth them. He doesn't say their heavenly father, he says your heavenly father. Now, if your father feeds a stranger, why won't he feed you? Ah, uh, no one's listening. If your father will feed a stranger, why won't he feed you? Oh, ye of little faith. Have sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him. Now, read the next statement. Come on. And have changed the king's word. Stop. That's not the emergency call I had in mind. <laughs> but uh, whoever that is, please sin no more. Have changed the king's word. Are you with me? What does that mean? Go to Proverbs 21. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Who has it? Who has it? A church full of slow people. Who has Proverbs 21? Ah, my handsome brother to the right. He has it. All right. Proverbs 21. How about people in the front? Have they found it yet? No, no, no. All right, sister. <laughs> sister, you finally found it. <laughs> okay. Proverbs 21. Let's read verse 1. Are you there? Read with me. Listen carefully. Read microscopically. Come on. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it with the so ever he will stop. We will reread microscopically, identifying the persons in that verse. Now, how many persons are in that verse? Two. Name them. The king and God. Tell me their status. God is. God is. Supreme. He's God of every, everything, heaven and earth. Tell me about the king. He rules over an earthly. So who's bigger? Mm -hmm. Now, listen to this. We have the most powerful being in the universe. What's his name? God. The most powerful being on earth. What's his name? King. The Bible says the big king can take the heart of the little king. And turn it anywhere he wants. So who controls whom? He controls them. Now, you live on earth under earthly kings. Are you with me? King Biden. If you're in England, King Johnson. <laughs> if you're in uh, wherever, China, King Xi Jinping. If you're in France, King Macron. Are you following me? All these kings. There is a king above who controls all of them. And sometimes God gets them to do what he wants. They're not even aware. There's a power controlling them. Somebody say amen for God. Amen. Now, amen. let's reduce it to your circumstance as we continue an emergency call. You are on the job. Your supervisor is the first cousin to Beelzebub. A horrible person. Making your life difficult. He's a king in the office. Are you following me? But you serve the king of heaven and earth. Can your king control him and... But remember what Nebuchadnezzar said, who trusteth in him, whom thou servest. Do you serve your God? Do you trust your God? God is not an ATM machine. We go when it's convenient. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. And so we go back to Daniel 3 verse 28 and have changed the king's word. Now go to Daniel 7. Our subject, an emergency call. And I need 15 more minutes. Can I have them say yes? yes? All right, thanks. Daniel 7. What verse do you think I'll read? 25. Ah, God bless you. 25. Are you there now? Speaking of a power called the little horn. Are you with me? In, in Thessalonians called the man of sin. In Revelation 13 called what? The beast from the sea. The beast from the sea. All right. Read 25 with me. And he shall seek to change, speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. Stop. The Bible says there's a power on earth that will think to change times and law. Now, laws are written things. We know that. Either on paper or in the head. You know the law. Here's a power challenging God. 
Go to Daniel 2. Daniel 2. Read verse 21. This is about God. This is Daniel just before he explains the vision of Daniel 2. This is his preamble. So Nebuchadnezzar understands what's going on. Verse 21 of Daniel 2. What does the Bible say? And he changeth the times and the season. Who is that? The God of heaven and earth. Who is that power in 725 who wants to change the time? The little horn. But the little horn cannot change the word of God. What does Daniel 3.28 tell us? God changed the king's word. What king? The king of the Persians whose words never change. Ah, uh, you're not the word altereth not in their minds. The laws of the Medes and Persians change not. But not for God. He changed Darius' word. And brought Daniel out. Listen to me carefully. God rebuked an entire kingdom for one man. Abraham. He did it more than once. In chapter 12, he rebuked Pharaoh. For Abraham. In chapter 20, he rebuked Abimelech, the Philistine king, for Abraham. In chapter 26, he rebuked another Philistine king for Isaac. God can rebuke an entire nation to defend one of his children Amen. who trust in him and serve him. Now go to Revelation 18. Before we go there, no. Go to, go to Galatians 1. Let's see how dangerous churches are. It's uh, something after 12. Galatians 1. Who has to rush off to work? Can I see your help? Right. Okay. okay. What book did I say? What chapter? Reading from verse, let's read from 13. Galatians 1. New Testament, folks. New Testament. Galatians 1, reading from verse 13. Come on, come on, come on. Okay, all right, it's okay. Read it with me. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews. The word conversation there means conduct or behavior. Paul says, you know how I behaved in the past when I was a member of the Jews religion. That's the church. Are you with me? That's the church. Keep reading. How's that beyond measure? I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. How many churches in that verse? Two. Ah, you're not following me. It's my fault. Listen to the verse. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion. I was a member of this church. Hmm? As a member of that church, I persecuted the church of God. Stop. How many churches in that verse? Name them. The Jews' religion and the church of God. Which one belonged to God? The church of God. But there were two churches. One trying to destroy the other. Go to Revelation 17. John sees a vision of a woman. In Revelation, a woman represents a church, either a pure church or a corrupt church, and it's corrupt based on what it teaches. Are you with me? Its doctrine determines its corruptness or its purity. So we have two women in Revelation representing two churches, one in 12, the true church of God, one in 17, the corrupt church called Babylon. In vision, John sees something. Read verse 6 of, Gen of Revelation. Say, what does that say? And I saw what? A woman drunken with the blood of the, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Why did he wonder? Do you know what he was seeing? He was seeing a church destroying, come on, churches. Now, he'd been accustomed to the Roman Empire destroying countries. But he's seeing a religious organization destroying other religious or and he wondered and the angel said wherefore this thou marvel i will tell thee the mission of the woman of the beast that carries her which out of seven heads and ten horns sorry for rattling off don't marvel but he was stunned a church destroying a church but when nebuchadnezzar said bow that was a religious command 
when Nimrod set up a kingdom to oppose God, that was religious. And when Nebuchadnezzar didn't like the fact that his image, his golden head would pass away, he set up his. That was a religious opposition to God. Let me put it more clearly for you. Who said crucify him? The church. The church. John 1.1, 1, 1, he came into his own. His own received him not. Who was that? The church. I don't want to depress you, but you need to understand the word church is not always positive. There's a false church and there's a true church. Are you with me? <laughs> Go to Revelation 12. I have to let you go because too much information will confuse you. But there's so much I want to tell you. Revelation 12. Say that again. Take another week. <laughs> okay. Uh, you don't want me to live when I get home. Okay, Revelation 12, verse 17. Read that for me. Let me pray first. Father, as I continue to speak to the people whom you love so much, tell me what to tell them. In Jesus' name, amen. Read verse 17, Revelation 12. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. Stop. Read verse 9 of Revelation 12. Now concentrate, concentrate. The only person who should not concentrate is a corpse. Concentrate. Are you there now? Read verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan. Stop. Who is the dragon? Satan. Now go to verse 17 again. Well, hold on, hold on. Let, let us all get there as a family. Are we at verse 17? Read with me. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now notice, notice the grammar. And the dragon was wroth with the women. As a preacher, you run the risk of being politically incorrect. If I am politically incorrect, will you be nice and absorb it? Yes, yes, you will. The dragon was wroth with the woman. How many women is that? One. Listen to me carefully. Satan is most angry with one church. The others don't bother him. Church is not a threat to Satan. Truth is the threat. Oh, those of you online, you're still with me. The dragon was wroth with the woman. Now, we have some identification regarding this woman. Let's finish the verse from the beginning. Let's go on the way. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. Come on. And went to make war with the remnant of her sea, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Let's pick the first one. Keep the commandments of God. That's one identifying mark. Are you with me? Are you sure? Say amen. All right. Let's find another identifying mark. Go to Matthew 28. Matthew 28. And even though I pray from time to time, you must also pray in your own heart. Say, Lord, open my eyes to understand what that strange man is saying. Yes, pray and ask God for understanding. Amen. Do you have Matthew 28? Amen. Let's read from verse 18. Are you there? Not yet, not yet. As usual, not yet. Are we there now? Amen. Let's read together. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Come on. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Stop. Where did he send them? All nations. Give me another word for that. The whole world. Which means, if you're looking for the church of God, it should be, come on, all over the world. And it should be distinguished by its defense of the commandments of God. So we're adding peace. Revelation 12, 17, one distinguishing mark, the commandments of God. Matthew 28, 19 is found in all the world now. Be patient with me. 
If you are a member of a church, you have one branch in uh, Baytown, the other branch in Pasadena, and that's it. Hmm? That's it. What did Jesus say? Go where? In all the world. How long ago did he say that? 2,000 years ago. Well, let me be more gracious. You're a member of a church. You have a branch in Canada. You have one in Ecuador. You have one in North Korea. You have one in Japan. And you have one in Siberia. Is that a church of God? Based on what? No. According to the United Nations, there are almost 230 countries represented by the United Nations. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is in more than 200 of them. The only other church that comes close, tell me, is a Catholic church. Now, I said I may sound politically incorrect. Bear with me. The only other church that competes for vastness of influence is a Catholic church. But one of the identifying marks is what? The commandments of God. So you've got to go beyond a worldwide influence now. If you open the Bible, here's the order of the Ten Commandments. Let me pray again. Father, this is what the devil hates when I talk about your law. Defend me and defend us and defend the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Commandment one, thou shalt have no other gods. That's in Exodus 20. Commandment two, no images. Commandment three, don't take God's name in vain. Commandment four, remember the Sabbath day. Say amen. amen. Commandment five, honor thy father thy mother. Commandment six, thou shalt not kill. Commandment seven, no adultery. Commandment eight, no stealing. Commandment nine, no coveting. Commandment ten, no, no bear false witness. Commandment ten, no coveting. Now, listen to the ten commandments in the Catholic catechism. It's official document of theology. Commandment one, thou shalt have no other gods. Fine. Perfect score. Commandment two, thou shalt make no images. It is not in that catechism. It has been taken out. Are you listening to me? It's not enough to be all over the world. If you don't have truth, you're spreading error all over the world. So there's a benefit to going all over the world if you have truth. There's a tremendous damage if you preach error to be all over the world. So commandment three in the catechism is what? Remember the Sabbath. But in the Bible, it's four. Now, since they took out two, no images, they were left with nine. How do we get to ten? They split number ten into two. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. That's one commandment. The other one is, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. But if you are thinking, look at all the things the Bible says don't covet. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. That's a commandment. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. You should go on and say, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox. They should be commandment for each one. This should be about 16 commandments. <laughs> Only? Yeah, well, let's be not. The commandments have been so-called changed. Something else was done by that church. And God has people in that church. Don't misunderstand me. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold. The Sabbath in their mind is no longer Saturday. It's Sunday. He shall think to change times and laws. In the church council of Laodicea in 364, canon law number 29, Christians shall not Judaize on Saturday, but shall work on that day. But the Lord's day they shall specially honor. Sunday became known as the Lord's day, but that's not a biblical statement. Do not rest on Saturday. That's a church command. Work on Saturday, rest on Sunday. God says, work on Sunday, rest on Saturday. So we have a religious organization directly opposing God. I'll show you one other thing. Commandment 5 in God's version says what? Honor thy father and thy mother. Follow me closely. I wish I had a screen, but concentrate. Now this right hand represents the Bible's version. Are you with me? Because the right hand is the hand of power and victory. All right. On the Catholic version, because number two has been taken out, number five is now number four. Oh, you're, not, you're not with me yet. Are you with me? Number five is now number four. Now, how are the commandments divided? Two tables. Are you with me? On the first table, we have the first four. On the second table, the next six. Now, in the Bible's version, the first four have... No God before me, no images, don't take my name in vain, keep the Sabbath. That shows love for God. In the Catholic version, we have no gods before me, 
uh, images out. Keep this, uh, don't, um, no images, that's out. So we have, don't take none of them in uh huh. Sabbath, number four is honor thy father and thy mother. So where is the Pope? Because the Pope is the father in the Catholic Church. The mother is Mary. Come on. Where now has that church placed Mary and the Pope? On the side that belongs to whom? God. Mary is considered a savior. What's our subject? What's the emergency call? Get out. This is not harshness. This is life saving. Get out. Mary is an assistant savior. You go to Christ through Mary. Listen to Hebrews 1 3. Don't go, just listen. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins. Not with Mary or the angel Gabriel. By himself purged our sin, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus Christ does not need an assistant to his work. But Mary in that system is on table number one. That's reserved. That's why the Pope is God on earth. Mm -hmm. The Pope is God on earth. In 1870, I believe it was, or somewhere in that time, the law was passed making his word infallible when he sits on the throne, of course. I mean, if he's by the beach, no. But when he sits on his throne, the Pope, what he says is infallible. God sent a message in Revelation 18. Go there with me. I have to stop. I have to stop. Sorry. But decisions have to be made right now, this morning. Revelation 18, Father in heaven, as I conclude, do not stop giving me help. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Chapter 18 of Revelation, we read from verse 1. Are you there? Read with me and help me. And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Come on. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and a hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Stop now. Next verse, for all nations, come on, have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The church and the state mingling together, Amen. preaching false doctrine. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the merchants of the earth, what the kings of the earth, what have committed? Fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are wax, wax rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Now verse, this sounds very good. The church, you know, arm and arm with the state. Merchants, business, everything is fine. But notice verse 4. Read that for me. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her. My stop. Are you God's people? You can decide that with God. Come out of her. In prophecy, a woman is a church. Whether false or true. God says, Come out of her. My people, why? Keep reading. That ye be not be partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her place. Keep reading. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. And when God remembers, he acts. The rest of that chapter tells of the destruction of Babylon. Read verse 21. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, What? Thus with violence shall that city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. God will put an end to this system of error that influences the entire world. But let me tell you something. It also includes apostate Protestantism. In 1500s, under Martin Luther, the, the Protestants said, Sola scriptura which is the bible only there was a council of the church the catholic council called um, from 1545 to 1563 it met on and off they met to discuss how to deal with the protestants how to stop this Protestant reformation that was the main concern why they met on and off for 18 years what brought the council finally to an end and overthrew the protestants a catholic bishop i don't recall his name he challenged the protestants 
Here was his argument, and he couldn't answer him. You are challenging our authority to change laws. But you keep Sunday, which we created. Then you are actually a following our authority. And the Protestants had nothing to say. The sola scriptura people had nothing to say because sola scriptura <coughs> does not recognize Sunday as holy. It recognizes the seventh day of the week. So when that argument was made, the Protestants had lost it. The Catholic Church itself has in its written records, books, honest people should actually be Seventh-day Adventists. Because they keep the Bible Sabbath. No, I, I'm sorry I didn't bring it. It just came to my mind. I can find it and put it on YouTube or wherever. An honest person who should, act, should actually be a Seventh-day Adventist because they're the only ones who keep truly sola script. The church has said that. I was in a certain country preaching, and I'm finishing. I've said that three times. And uh, I offered $400. It was on a college campus. $400 is a fortune to any college student. And uh, to anyone who brings me two Bible texts, one, the first day of the week is holy. Two, God changed the Sabbath from the seventh to the first. So, well, since they're college students, they know how to do research. and Go, do, come back tomorrow night and get your money. Came back the next night for the meeting. I said, okay, I have come, get your money. Nobody moved. So I checked the mic. <laughs> come and get your money. Nobody moved. At the end of the service, a young man came to me. This actually happened. <laughs> he said, Pastor, I looked for those two verses. I couldn't find them. But can I still have the money? <laughs> <laughs> I said, you can forget that. <laughs> no, he literally said, can I still have the money? <laughs> I was doing another series in Detroit. Literally happened. And I spoke on the Sabbath being the Saturday, not Sunday. It's amazing how people don't realize Sunday is not the Sabbath. And many of them are just honest. And I offered $2,500, put up by the church members, literally. To anyone who brings me those two texts. So a lady who had been attending, she went home to her husband who was a Baptist. She said, honey, we need to do some repairs around the house. This 2,500 will just do it. Give me two texts. Let me go get the money. She came back and told me. The husband said, yeah. She said, what? Ah, yeah. She said, honey, what are you saying? There are no such texts. She said, then why do we do it? You know what he said? I was born a Baptist, you finish it for me, I'll die a Baptist. Couldn't find the text. Let me close. You see this? What's our subject? There's the emergency call from the Bible to all people who claim to love God to get out of church environments where the love of God is downtrodden. Because the law of God is the very expression of the righteousness of God. Amen. And so God says, come out of her. That's a call of love. Yeah. And some may say, but it's been in the family for years. Come out. What do I tell my husband? Come out. Because the alternative when Christ comes will be ugly. If you do not believe me. You see, God in his mercy, when Jerusalem was destroyed in between AD 66 and 70, the Romans came and surrounded the city, then mysteriously they withdrew. During that period of withdrawal, a lot of Christians left the city, all of them. Not one of them was killed in the destruction. The Romans came back. And you read the horrible conditions that fell upon that city. People were eating people. Mothers would make agreements, I'll eat your son today, and you eat my son tomorrow. Because they rejected the lawgiver, Jesus Christ. Does the law save you? No. But the law is an expression of what Jesus saves you to. Amen. Are you following me? If I save you from sin, I must save you to something. And sin is a violation of God's law. A righteous life is a life in harmony with God's law. That's why we're saved by faith. We're judged by works. And so today, there's an emergency call. Answer it. Come out. I'm not joking. Come out of the churches that do not respect the law of God.
regardless of whatever else they say. Now, if you come to the Adventist church, are we overrun with saints? I never said that. But you don't join a church based on how well the people dress. You join it based on does it preach, thus saith the Lord. And so in John 6, when many disciples left Christ, John 6, 66, he turned to the 12 and said, Will you also go away? And Peter said, Lord, where shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. What kept those men? Truth. I was a Catholic. I wanted to be a priest until my mother found out and she yanked me out. And I'll never stop thanking her. I hope to see her in the resurrection. She found out the priest had his eyes on me to make me a priest. I was an altar boy. I served with the priest on the altar. And I felt very proud in my, in my gown and white and red. And I felt like a saint. And the priest said, you know, you have, you have potential to be a priest. And my mother said, mm-mm. And she stopped us from going to church. And she found out that God had a holy day called the Sabbath found an Adventist church, took us to it, and my only regret is that I wasn't born into it. But you accept what you have, and you thank God that light has come. Someone listening to me needs to make a decision to leave that Sunday honoring church and come where truth is taught. When the rich young ruler came to Christ, let me finish, I have to finish. He said, yet lackest thou what? One thing. Sell all that thou hast and distribute unto the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come follow me. One thing you lack, for many listening to me, you've got one thing you're lacking. Change your day of worship from man-made to God-made. For someone else, you remind me of the scribe in Mark 12. Jesus said, thou art not far from the kingdom of God. You're close. Make one change. The day. You're close. This is not salvation by works. This is love expressed in obedience. You are close. Don't get so close and be lost. Make a decision, I tell you, to come out of any church that does not honor the law of God. Because honoring his law is his will for us. Wherever you are online, you don't have to discuss it in order to make the decision. You make the decision. Make it, then announce it to your husband or your wife or your children or your mother. You make the decision. And then say, God, I have chosen in accordance with this emergency call, come out of her, my people. Because Jesus said in John 10, 10, 10, 16, other sheep I have, which a lot of this fold, them also I must bring. So he's bringing you. Don't fight him. Come. Is there anyone in this congregation who needs to make that decision? Can I see your hand? Lord, let me come to where the truth is taught. The com ah, God bless you. God bless you. I want his name written down on something. Where is the, where is the name writer? Someone write that brother's name. God loves him. Someone move fast and get his name. And I'm not leaving this place until we have his name. Mm-hmm. Okay, here's someone. Okay. Someone else make a decision. Come to where the truth is taught. Obey God. God wants to save you, but he cannot save you in error. Someone else. Father, I'm answering this call. I need to come out. Now someone is saying, I'm afraid. I have this problem. I have this obstacle. Jesus says, the things that are impossible with men are possible with God. 1 John 5, 3. This is love. That we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous or hard. They are not. This is hard. God will change it. Someone else. Father, there's fear in my heart that I'm making the choice to come out. Probation will not be open forever. When God closed the door of the ark, those outside couldn't get in. And those inside were safe. Someone online, make that decision. Someone at Born Again or FMC, make that choice to obey this emergency call and come out of a system where error is the way of life. Come where the truth is taught. Where God's church is identified is all over the world and it defends the law of God as a standard of righteousness, not an instrument of salvation. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I didn't mean to go so long. If I offended you, forgive me. But I want us to say so much on this final day. Dear Father, there's someone listening to me now who is fighting the conviction. The person is fighting it. How can I do this? 
But Father, through your spirit, reach that person, help him or her to understand. And I believe in my heart it's a her. To understand that time is running out. Please, God, reach that person, please. If you truly mean it when you say you're not willing that any should perish, reach that person, Father. Make that person miserable until that decision is made to come out. Father, and for those who've decided, bless them with strength because the devil has already begun to make plans to discourage them. In the name of Jesus, dear God, take my weak effort, Father, weak effort, but multiply its effect that many more decisions may be made. Bless the rest of this service, Father. Take all the glory and hasten the day when we will live in a world where everything will be righteous and according to your will. I pray from my heart in Jesus' name. Amen.